Inga mana, inga reo, inga ta wira pumanoa, ro rakatira ma, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenatato katoa. Good evening, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Harleen Hain, and I have the great privilege of being the Vice Chancellor here at the University of Otago. And it is a great pleasure to welcome each and every one of you to this inaugural professorial lecture for Professor Shelley Griffiths. Um, as is typical for these lectures, as I look out on the audience, um, I see members of the academic and professional staff here at the University of Otago, and I see many of our students, and it's fantastic to have so many people here. I also see members of the general public, and I want to remind you that you are always welcome um, and warmly welcome to attend these inaugural professorial lectures, and I know that many people um, around the Dunedin community use them as an opportunity to continue with their own lifelong learning. I'd like to extend a very special welcome um, to two other people who are here this evening, um, Shelley's husband Trevor and her son Tim, um, who are also here with us this evening. And we recognize as a university community that becoming a professor sometimes takes you away from family life. So we certainly appreciate the time that you have shared with us um, in allowing Shelley to spend more time here. Now, as you know, um, the rank of professor is the pinnacle of academic life for any academic. Um, and at the University of Otago, we have incredibly exacting standards for promotion from within. In order to achieve the rank of professor, an individual must demonstrate sustained, outstanding su su sustained leadership um, in a number of different areas, um, including teaching, research, and service to the university, to their profession, and to the wider community. Now, as you will soon le learn from um, Professor Griffith's lecture, um, she is an internationally recognized expert in tax law. Uh, she's also a very gifted teacher, and I suspect that that will come through in her lecture as well. She has also provided outstanding service both to the university as well as to her profession. Now here at Otago, we've been well aware of Shelley's considerable strengths for a very long period of time. But we are not the only ones who have recognized her academic gifts. When we sought feedback, for example, from experts in her field in the course of making a decision about her promotion, uh, we heard things like, Shelley is one of a very small group of New Zealand taxation law scholars who are well known in the international tax academic community. Her reputation derives both from her presentations at international conferences and her publications in international books and journals. She is viewed by the community as one of the best thinkers and presenters in the field. We also heard, Shelley's scholarly research has had an outstanding impact nationally and internationally as evidenced by the range of invitations from prestigious international universities to collaborate the international and domestic citations of her work in academic papers, her citation by the New Zealand courts, including the Supreme Court, and her demonstrated influence on national law reform. So as you can see, Shelley has ex excelled not only uh, in terms of the academy, but her work has also proven to be incredibly useful for the law profession. So, Professor Griffiths, on behalf of the University of Otago, I would like to warmly welcome you to give your inaugural professorial lecture, and I would like to congratulate you on your very well-earned promotion. But before you speak, I will first call on the Dean of the School of Law, Professor Mark Hennigan, who will tell us just a little bit more about Shelley's journey uh, to Professor Noreda Tenakoto Tenakoto Tenatato Katoa. Tenakoto Katoa. It is my great pleasure to welcome and introduce tonight my colleague and uh, known Shelley for a very long time, Professor Shelley Griffiths, to give her inaugural professorial lecture. Professor Griffith is a, a proud graduate of the University of Otago and holds a BA majoring in history with first class honours, an MA in history, a BCom majoring in accounting and finance, and an LLB degree with first class honours. Professor Griffiths joined the Faculty of Law at the Otago University as a lecturer in 2001. Prior to joining the faculty, Professor Griffiths worked as a senior accountant at DC Evans & Company Chartered Accountants and as an accountant and audit manager with Coopers & Library and Chartered Accountants. In her time at the Law Faculty today, Professor Griffiths has shown that she's a highly accomplished and very 
versatile teacher. Professor Griffiths teaches company law, taxation law, advanced company law, securities market regulation, advanced taxation, and intellectual property. She's also a very highly valued tutor in public law. In the past, she tutored in our beginning course of, of legal system. As we heard from the Vice Chancellor, Professor Griffiths is internationally recognised and very widely cited in two quite distinct areas of legal research, very demanding areas as well, taxation and the regulation of securities markets. Professor Griffiths' research in taxation has been published by internationally renowned publishers such as Hart Publishing in Oxford, Oxford University Press in the UK, Edward Elgar Publishers in the UK, Peter Lang Publishers in Germany, and in a highly ranked international journal such as the, the highest ranked journal in the field, the British Tax Review and the Australian Business Review. Professor Griffiths' work in the regulation of securities market has been published by Thomson Reuters, uh, widely recognised as the top international pu legal publisher in the world, New Zealand Business Law Quarterly, and the Companies and Securities Law Journal. The citations for P Professor Griffiths' work give it high praise. I just want to give you a couple of examples, as the Vice Chancellor did. One reviewer described her work in tax as compelling and standing out. Another reviewer commented on her work in securities law and said that it stood out in terms of readability and the interweaving of theoretical and policy perspectives and the depth of research and coverage. Based on her international uh, reputation as a scholar, Professor Griffiths has presented many major conference presentations, Sydney, Canberra, Cambridge, Oxford, York, Hong Kong, Vienna, Prato in Italy, as well as in, within New Zealand. Professor Griffiths has done a, a wide range of service activities, both within the university and within the profession. Um, she has chaired six major reviews in this university and been a, on a panel of a number of other reviews. Professor Griffiths was the chairperson of the Columbia College Board of Governors, and she's currently a board member of the Otago Festival of the Arts. She's a barrister solicitor of the High Court of New Zealand and associate member of the New Zealand Law Society. Professor Griffiths is a registered chartered accountant and a member of the Banking and Financial Services Law Association, where she also serves as deputy chair of the academic committee. Professor Griffiths is a member of the International Fiscal Association, the Tax Research Network, Society of Legal Scholars UK, Australasian Tax Teachers Association and Corporate Law Teachers Association. Professor Griffiths is also a research fellow of the Taxation Law and Policy Research Institute at Monash University in Melbourne, which shows her, her wide recognition. Professor Griffiths is a member of the editorial board for the Journal of Banking and Finance Law and Practice and a member of the advisory board for the New Zealand Journal of Taxation Law and Policy, both internationally highly ranked journals. It gives me great pleasure and great delight to invite Professor Shelley Griffiths to give her inaugural professorial lecture on the topic, Tax is Law. Good luck, Shelley. Thank you for those kind words from Harleen and Mark, and thank you all for coming. When I first joined the university, I went to a new staff conference. And at the evening dinner, I was sitting next to a very amiable, not here. Should it be on? It is on. It is on? Can you? Better? Awesome. Right. So. Might as well start from the beginning. <laughs> when I first joined the university, I went to a new staff conference, and at the evening dinner, I was sitting next to a very amiable woman whose daily work took her into the bowels of the clock tower. She said that for promotion, it was important to get on the right committees. So in my uncomplicated way, I said, oh, what committees are those? And she said to me that when I needed to know, I would find out. <laughs> Well, it's now apparent to me I was already on one of those committees. I was by then a parent representative on the University Child Care Committee. <laughs> on that committee with me were Sean Fitzsimons, now a Professor of Geography, Barbara Brooks, now a Professor of History, and Barbara had not long become Chair, succeeding Professor Harleen Hain. <laughs> Twenty years ago last summer, I decided to return to the completion of my law degree I'd left behind me. Well, the job as a chartered accountant and two very small children, I'm not quite sure in retrospect why I felt the need to embark on such an undertaking, but I did. In late January that year, when I returned to work, I rang and made an appointment to see the Dean. And I met with Stuart Anderson, who was very helpful in letting me recommence in the middle of the degree without doing the bits of second year I had left behind. 
Had I encountered the Contractual Mistakes Act and Condon and Azolans, I would not be here today. <laughs> By the end of the first year during jurisprudence and tax, I was addicted. Unlike many people who have spoken of the start of their career as a member of the law faculty staff, I don't have a Mark Hennigan driving story. However, he did call me one evening about 5.30. I had two slightly bigger but still very young children, perhaps a bit tired but never fractious, and I was a meal cooking, to ask me if I was interested in lecturing position at the University of Otago Law Faculty. And so it came to pass with the ink barely dry on my LLB honours degree, I started my academic career here. It's turned out to be a fascinating, satisfying experience for me. And everyone, academic and professional staff and students, make this law faculty a very special place. I must, of course, mention Mark for his positive leadership and his personal support of me, particularly enabling me to forge links with tax scholars from all around the world. And to all of you who have been friends and scholars over the and colleagues over the past few years. I was rather worried that the university department would be uh, rather too quiet and isolated for my personal taste, but it turned out I was not the only one with a tea addiction. It also turned out that being put in an office on the eighth floor has been a splendid piece of luck. I went to mention also the students. We wouldn't be here but for them. And I acknowledge especially the honours students that I've worked with. Their research has often been very helpful springboard for my own work. And I particularly want to mention those who have done advanced tax, because in those classes I have been able to firm up some of my own thoughts. Of course, on this journey I have been on since I joined the faculty, it would not have been possible without support and patience and the sounding board at home. Without the support of Trevor and Tim and Alexandra, I couldn't have embarked on that indulgent folly of a law degree, much less forged a career as an academic lawyer. As Harleen said, Trevor and Tim are here tonight, and many of you will know that our daughter and sister, Alexandra, died in the winter of 2012, halfway through her law and French degrees. I thank the three of them for their constant presence in my life. And at this point, those of you who did know Alexandra would know she'd be saying, get on with it, and so I shall. As has been said, I've got two distinct areas of research, taxation and capital market regulation. That phrase trips easily off my tongue. I've used it in every promotion and progression application I've ever written, and this is a nod to Richard in every PBRF research profile I have ever written. Thinking about this talk made me think, was well, there something I could discuss that would link them? And I can't think of anything, so I have decided not to. <laughs> Why such distinct strands of research? When I was a teenager, I clearly remember my music teacher telling me after I couldn't be at something to do with music because I had to be somewhere else, that I was a jack of all trades and master of none. That might well be true. But talking about that would lead me to a more public display of self-reflection that I would never want to engage in, so I'll leave that for right now. The more practical and prosaic reason is I was hired specifically to teach tax and capital market regulation and university teaching is research-informed teaching, and that's where my research path lay. So since I can't combine the two, as you can see by the topic of this talk, I've chosen to talk about my tax research. So what about my tax research? Well, there are many amendments every year to the Income Tax Act, but the changes that are made are rarely of any significance. So that didn't seem like a particularly fulfilling research pathway. The one area that did perhaps seem a little more fruitful was a, as a research theme, was tax avoidance, but that was a very crowded academic space. Then two things happened. I read an article by Philip Baker, an English tax silk, formerly a full-time academic, and presently a visiting professor at Oxford. It was entitled, Taxation and the European Convention on Human Rights. And then in 2003, Sir Ivor Richardson, then recently retired as president of the Court of Appeal, visited the faculty. I have a photo of this. <laughs> now, the keen-eyed among you will see that that is not, in fact, Sir Ivor speaking to the tax class. That's me. And that's Sir Ivor sitting in the back. I think what's also notable about that wonderful photo is not one student has a laptop. <laughs> 
And this thingy at the front does not look like the bridge of the Starship Enterprise back then. <laughs> Talking to Sir Ivor afterwards, he said he'd often wondered why the Bill of Rights Act had been so little used in non-criminal areas of the law. So Philip's article and Sir Ivor's comment set me off on what has actually been the dominant theme of my research. Is tax public law? And if it is, why does it seem so different? Why is tax different? Should it be? Internationally, there are a number of scholars who think about this and it's referred to rather grandly as tax exceptionalism. But that's only one aspect of really a bigger question. For in many instances, in many ways, tax is thought of as being part of commercial law. And in that context, it also seems quite different from other areas of the law. For many lawyers, and particularly for law students, tax is seen as being in its own special box, somehow disconnected from law. It's specialised, distinct, odd, opaque, difficult, weird, not quite like anything else. At least in respect of income tax, that oddness is probably a result of the fact that to state the obvious, income tax is levied on income. But what income is, is a much more complex and elusive concept than we might first think. Indeed, as James Sean Elias has noted, income tax legislation deals with a wholly artificial universe constructed by law. Now, if you're not immediately thrilled by the thought that you're not going to hear about that tonight, let me assure you that you probably should be. And in fact, I see some people in the audience who have been in my tax classes and they'll know exactly why you should, the rest of you should be pleased. So my research has been to think about tax as a species of public law. And what I want to do in this talk is to think about the symptoms and the causes of this apparent oddity, that tax is somehow not really law. So rather than talk about my personal research journey, I thought I would explore the journey of tax law as a subject, both in teaching and in research. And it's through that lens I hope to explore the more general theme of this talk, which is thinking about tax as law. Fifty years ago, the aforementioned Sir Ivor Richardson, and people who've done a taxation paper will recognise him as the hero of that course, was a professor at the law faculty at Victoria University, and he delivered his inaugural professorial lecture. He ended by reflecting on the ongoing problems and issues that he discussed by saying what I've got there. And the point I have emphasised is he's talking about tax law as a developing subject. In 1943, the United States Supreme Court had said that no other branch of the law touches human activities at so many points. Why, 20 years later, was its study described as developing? By 1967, there was nothing particularly novel about the phenomenon of taxation. There was a land tax in England when William the Conqueror ordered the Doomsday Survey in 1086. There was a salt tax in China about 1000 BC. The 18th century English window tax is relatively well known, and the Boston Tea Party protest at tax on tea in 1773 is probably even better known. In New Zealand, the government had raised revenue in addition to the proceeds from land sales, for a host of excise and taxes and duties in the 19th century. A land tax was passed in 1878. It was enforced for a year when a change of government led it to be replaced by a property tax. That also became extraordinarily unpopular, and it was ultimately replaced by the Land and Income Tax Act 1981, 1991, 1891. Before World War I, land tax and excise duties were the principal source of revenue. But thereafter, income tax increasingly became the predominant tax. By 1916, the income tax part of the statute was in the structure in which it would broadly remain until 1994. Why then would Professor Richardson describe tax law as a developing subject some 80 years after the enactment of the Land and Income Tax Act? In 2006, I wrote in a review of a book that taxes of subject lawyers often shy away from. As a result, chartered accountants have established virtual hegemony over tax practice. By the middle of the 20th century, the Commissioner of Inland Revenue could report on the close relationship between himself, the district commissioners, and the taxation commissioners, the committees of the Society of Accountants. He reported no liaison or relationship with the law societies, probably because there was none. 
Those comments from Sariva there acknowledge that tax requires a pluralistic approach. And into this goes law and history and philosophy and political science and economics and accounting. Each of those disciplines has got a lot to contribute. And in fact, it's this multidisciplinary dimension that makes tax so endlessly fascinating. But into it, it is important that we continue to think of legal analysis so that other disciplines take into account and properly understand the legal systems and rights and obligations, relationships and organisations and procedures. But the point I want to think about tonight is subtly different. I want to think about what might be lost if tax law is isolated from other law. Is there learning in other areas of the law that have been ignored in tax? Alternatively, are other areas of the law missing something by putting tax in a special sealed box? So before looking at a couple of short particular examples which I think might lead some, shed some light on that, I want to review the teaching of tax in this university and to have a brief look at the history of academic research in tax. And because this is history, this will explain an awful lot. Any discussion about the teaching of any subject at law at Otago needs to be thought about in the context of teaching law more generally. The full-time university study for an LLB, or joint degree, completed with a post-graduation professionals course, has been the model since the 1970s. A broad review of legal education since the 19th century reveals a rather checkered story with some particularly weak patches. But the overall trajectory through the 20th century was toward increasing numbers of full-time staff. With the appointment of its first full-time professor in 1959, Otago was not an especially fast follower of a trend that had begun many years earlier in Victoria and Auckland universities. Toward full-time students, two years full-time at the university was recommended from the mid-1930s and full-time students became the norm in the 1970s and the creation of the Council of Legal Education in 1930. The content of the law degree changed surprisingly little, and it was later, around the early 1970s that there was any choice of papers in addition to a core. In 1927, this is what a law degree <coughs> looked like. If you wanted to be a barrister, you had to do an LLB with all that in it. If you only wanted to be a solicitor, you could choose one of Latin, English or philosophy, and you didn't have to study Roman or international law. This mixture of some general knowledge plus specialised law subject had been the norm by a very long time. By 1927, practice and procedure had made an appearance in the curriculum, and that was the first year that company law was included in the LLB. That subject had the same lectures, <coughs> curriculum and teacher as the Faculty of Commerce paper. And that was how it remained until the mid-1950s. In comparison, commerce students studied quite a lot of law. For instance, in 1948, accountancy law consisted of mercantile law one and two, sounds deadly dull, company law, bankruptcy law, and trustee law. One lecture per subject a week, and I'm almost loath to mention this, at 7.45 a.m., <laughs> Monday to Friday, except in the occasional year when the Monday lecturer was, I think um, we might get Harleen to fill her ears at the moment, except in the occasional year when the Monday lecture was substituted one on a Saturday. This law degree, therefore, had a very strong common law flavour. Very little emphasis on statute law, and a smattering of what we might call practically oriented subjects. The lack of statute law in the degree might seem somewhat surprising in light of the fact that in 1927, the New Zealand Parliament enacted 77 statutes. In the eight volumes of the 1931 reprint of the 1908-1931 statutes, there were more than 1,500 statutes. But there was no or little statute law in the degree. Most of the law students, and indeed the graduates in this room, will recognise a lot of familiar material in that structure. This was the basis of the law curriculum for a very long time, and I'd say in many ways it still is. New Zealand's legal education has been described by Stuart Anderson as being doctrinally and professionally oriented. This has been described in the English context as the classical curriculum. So returning to my more specific query, what about tax? 
As far as I've been able to ascertain, text in any form was taught for the first time at Otago in 1914. Preparation of tax returns was one of the topics in a subject called advanced bookkeeping in the Faculty of Commerce. By 1920, the Land and Income Tax Act 1916 was one of the statutes included in that omnibus subject accountancy law. Now the need for accountants to be able to do this sort of work is not surprising. In 1914, there were 14,000 income tax returns filed, and by 1929, that number had gone up to 55,000. Many small traders and businesses, no doubt, required the services of an accountant to complete these returns. No wonder that accountancy education responded, providing the skill and the knowledge. But in one form or another, taxation has been taught continuously to accounting students for over 100 years. In 1953, taxation finally made its way into the law degree, when the subject conveyancing was amended to become conveyancing and taxation. Conveyancing had been taught since about 1928 and was at first called practical conveyancing. The 1958 prescription for conveyancing and taxation described the taxation content as the law relating to land and income tax, gift duty, death duty and conveyance duty. They got through a power of stuff in those days. We'll return to this influence of a state and gift duty later. 1967 is a major change to the structure of the LLB degree, and conveyancing and taxation ceased to be a subject in the degree. For a short period, taxation continued to be taught in a composite subject with conveyancing, but was one that had to be done in addition to the LLB degree as part of the requirements for admission as a barrister and solicitor. In 1972, choice appeared in the subjects for the degree for the first time. Taxation and estate planning became an optional paper, but it remained compulsory for admission. That it broadly remained until the end of the 1980s, from which time the taxation paper became optional for the degree. Professional qualification was altered to a standalone programme, administered outside the universities, and in which taxation did not and does not feature. So this brief story indicates that some studies in taxation have been compulsory for accountancy students since 1914. For law students, there was no opportunity to study tax until 1953, and for a period of about 30 years, it was a compulsory requirement for admission to practice law, but taught, I would suggest, in a rather practical manner. Notably, when it was compulsory, or when it was a part of the professional examinations, it was almost always coupled with estate planning. Tax was therefore, I think, studied by lawyer students in an instrumentalist manner. Thinking now about academic research on tax through a legal framework. Now, I conducted a very, 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 very simple survey, and I hope no experts on surveys are here, by looking at publications in two academic law journals, the New Zealand University's Law Review, published first in 1963, and to keep this homely, the Otago Law Review, first published in 1965. Now, the result of this survey didn't particularly surprise me. So, between 1963 and 2000, there were eight articles published in the New, Ze New Zealand University's Law Review on tax matters. You'll see, actually, some old hoary old chestnuts there. Should we have a capital gains tax? <laughs> <laughs> 2080, we'll be having articles about that too, I would venture. And the Otago Law Review had the grand sum of five, but on the stage planning, and four on the more esoteric subject of the definition of income. Now, this is an incomplete picture, focusing on two academic law journals. But the figures, I think, give a useful flavour of the extent of academic legal publications and tax. They also highlight what seemed important. Again, we see estate planning and the influence of death duties. And we also see this ongoing issue about what on earth is income. The importance of those topics can be seen in probably the two major taxation books that were published in New Zealand in that period. The 1970 is Guide to Estate Duties, by, edited by Sir Ivor Richardson. And John Preble's work on the taxation of property transactions, published in 1986. John's work, I think, is probably the first academic legal monograph published in taxation in New Zealand. There has, however, never been a legally oriented textbook in tax. 
What is also notable that although through the 1980s there was a period of significant tax reform, there was very little academic writing about tax from a legal perspective. As my less than random sample from a couple of academic journals shows, that period did not foster much engagement in such writing, although lawyers were involved to some degree in advisory committees. I then also have looked at the annual reports of the law faculty and the calendars of the University of Otago. They indicate that the first tax article written by an Otago law academic was by Andrew Beck in 1987. The title was Tax in the Academic, a Raw Deal, in which he reviewed the income tax deductibility, or more accurately non-deductibility, of research and education costs incurred by academics. <laughs> Professor Peter Sum, who was in fact the second professor of law at Otago, had published about tax, but while he was at Auckland, so we're not going to count that. <laughs> as far as I can tell, he did no tax work once he came to Otago. In February 1996, a specialist academic law journal, the New Zealand Journal of Taxation, Law and Policy, was, in a, was launched. <coughs> and Sir Ivor's remarks at the launch were published in the first edition. He said that, more than with most specialties, tax work requires an understanding of policies underlying the legislation. That was because no other legislation is, as he said, more far-reaching and pervasive. The subject matter he deals with, he said, was comprehensive and complicated. And because the legislation can never be a complete code, those who interpret it and administer it need to have a clear understanding of the economic, social and administrative policies underlying it. Despite this importance, he said, 30 years after he'd written his inaugural professorial lecture, that only a handful of major policy and principle oriented articles on tax subjects have been published in New Zealand in recent years. Tax administration had not been a major field of research even though, as he said, it raised major questions of the application of public law values. That journal was designed to fill the gap. Although I did not actually read that until somewhat after I had begun writing about tax administration, I guess I might say that my own research has tried to fill some of that gap. So why was all this so? Well, I think the reason why tax was treated as important for commerce students and more specifically for accountancy students, is both self-explanatory and self-perpetuating. Preparation of tax returns for small, medium and large businesses and individuals provided both a stream of work and was and is a supply of a necessary service. The dominance of the accounting profession in tax discourse and its day-to-day -day interaction with the Inland Revenue Department was a natural consequence of that. The reasons why law tax remained ignored by the legal profession and by lawyers are, I venture, rather more complex. As we have seen, legal education in New Zealand was for a very long time tightly prescribed, common law focus, and strongly shaped by the needs of practice. Once estate planning became important in the 1950s, and that was given further impetus in the wake of the 1968 legislation, legal education took a little more notice. I've always begun my tax classes by talking about one of the key differences between tax law and other branches of the law, and that is there is no mischief in a tax. The law generally responds to right wrongs, to mediate relationships, to allocate risk, to punish and deter. It responds to such things as, he hit someone, she stole his money, there's a snail in my ginger beer. Your contaminant leaked into my water supply. You can see I did my legal system tutoring. Your fence is on my property. You sold me a machine and it does not work. There's no such mischief in a tax. Tax is designed to raise revenue. The Bill of Rights in 1689 established that there could be no taxation without the consent of the taxpayer. And taxes therefore had to be levied by statute. There is no common law of taxation. From the start, this gave tax a public character. Now, it might be thought that that made tax unambiguously law, quintessentially law. But it has been noted that this fact actually set it apart from law as was generally practiced. 
Most of those engaged in the practice of law were concerned on a daily basis with the private law of property and contract and wills and succession. That, of course, is the law that classical legal training prepared students for. A 19th century lawyer might have said of tax, it's law, but not as we know it. The rise of the regulatory state in the 20th century, of which tax is an integral part, has changed that, but to a large degree, old habits have run deep. The consequence of two of this fundamental principle of taxation by consent was that tax legislation had to be written as clearly and unambiguously as possible. Tax could only by le be levied by very clear and precise provisions. That also has a number of consequences. First, because tax is a technical matter that applies to real life situations of an almost infinite variety, the taxation the legislation needs to cover as many situations as is possible. Because of that, and that need for certainty and clarity of statutory ambit, tax statutes became ever longer and more complex. Secondly, because of that constitutional nature of taxation, tax statutes were interpreted strictly, literally. By the last quarter of the 20th century, that alone distinguished tax statutes from other legislation. And additionally, as a practical matter, administrators, not judges, had the principal role in the interpretation of ta statutory provisions. The primary role of assessment, the quantification of a tax liability, lay with an official, a member of the executive branch of government. In New Zealand, that person has been styled under various names, was currently the Commissioner of Inland Revenue. The very act of assessment required administrative interpretation of the legislation. This level of bureaucratic engagement is another point of distinction between tax law and most other areas of the law. Perhaps it's not surprising that tax was perceived as an administrative regulation rather than law. Discussing the evolution of academic study of tax law in Britain, the distinguished legal historian Chantal Stebbings has written, Sitting in this way, outside the norms of the legal system and its key elements, at best can be perceived as distinct from other branches of English law, and at worst is not law at all, tax was not embraced within the academic study of law in Britain. It seems to me that that has largely been true in New Zealand as well. Now, does this isolation of tax law matter? It's just this an interesting story with some facts and figures. Well, I think it does matter. Elsewhere I've described this as the ghettoisation of tax law, and I want now to turn to a couple of brief examples of why I think this really does matter. There are many examples of this, but I've chosen two that I think demonstrate the implications of leasing tax in its own sealed box, as it were. The first illustrates that something might be lost to tax and its administration this categorisation. The second suggests that other aspects of the law might lose something from treating tax law as exceptional. So my first example is the Commissioner of Inland Revenue's power of search and seizure. At this point I'm about to put up a terrible section. Judged by 2017 standards of statute writing, that is an absolute shocker. I don't expect you to read it. Section 16, I'll split up here, basically says that the Commissioner of Inland Revenue has at all times full and free access to all lands, buildings and places and documents that she considers necessary or relevant for the purpose of carrying out any of her functions. A warrant is required for access to a private dwelling. There appear very few constraints on this power. The Commissioner doesn't have to have informed a view there are not less intrusive ways of getting this information, or that a tax may have failed to discharge his or her obligations. The Commissioner has no obligation to meet any objective test on when to engage this power. Applied literally, the Commissioner or an authorised officer could enter any business premises at any hour of the day or night, because all business premises will surely contain information that's necessary or relevant to the Commissioner's obligation to assess tax liability. 
On the other hand, Section 21 of the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act states that everyone has the right to be secure against unreasonable search or seizure, whether of the person, property, correspondence or otherwise. Section 16 sits in a somewhat uneasy relationship with Bora, but that is a matter for another day. But given the intrusive nature of all search and seizure powers, and the potential for abuse, and the relationship with the Bora protected right, it's not surprising that there have been reviews about the nature and the extent and the controls over powers of search and seizure. The New Zealand Law Commission conducted in-depth reviews in 2002, in 2007, and have recently revisited the issue. The 2002 preliminary paper on entry, search and seizure, reviewed the scope and adequacy of controls on all such powers that exist in New Zealand. And it then categorised all these powers into two groups. Group 1 powers were called powers of routine administrative inspection. And Group 2 powers were those where an offence is suspected. From that simple categorisation, the Law Commission went on to develop appropriate principles to constrain and supervise the use of these powers. And their aim was to develop a nice set of rules that ought to apply to every such power consistently. And the content of those rules would depend on the, content, on the category into which the power fell. Well, it all seems very logical. So the proposed rules governing the entry onto land by way of administrative inspection included that the entry ought to be during daylight, the officer affecting the entry ought to have some appropriate identification, and if the occupant wasn't present, then every effort ought to be made to tell the occupant, including leaving a conspicuous written note. Different rules, where somebody was, an individual was suspected of some sort of criminality, those rules required additional protections. So the report classified this lovely power in section 16 as belonging to group one, a routine administrative power. Without any overt analysis, the commissioner's powers were categorised as concerning routine administrative matters either. Now there's no reason why the commissioner cannot use section 16 for administrative purposes such as those, but it's clear from the commissioner's own operational statements that that's not the predominant use she makes of section 16. The commissioner also has a power to require information to be disclosed, and that's the one that is used most frequently and routinely. Indeed, it's perhaps not surprising that the occasions when section 16 search and seizure power is used is in what the commissioner considers the more serious situations. The specific examples that she describes are where there is a history or risk of non-compliance and or lack of cooperation, when it is likely that documents might be at risk, or when it's likely that the case involves revenue, revenue offending, tax crimes, including fraud and invasion. She considers also that the power might be used to address problems of aggressive tax planning and tax avoidance. Now, the first three categories that she states involve some sort of offence. Aggressive tax planning and tax avoidance are not illegal per se, although they may attract a penalty that's been characterised by the Supreme Court as penal. Thus we could say that the predominant use of Section 16 would seem to fall quite squarely within the law enforcement function. The Law Commission's 2002 report specifically excluded the search and seizure power in the Tax Administration Act from Category 2. To put it bluntly, the power was incorrectly categorised. In reality, perhaps uniquely, the Commissioner's power of search and seizure falls into both categories 1 and 2. In a full-scale survey of, of search and surveillance, the true nature of the Commissioner's powers was not considered. Now, there's a lot to ponder about Section 16, and ponder it I have, and ponder it those have who are in the advanced tax class. This evening's not the time for that. But I might be so bold as to suggest that a major review of all such powers in New Zealand legislation was, in fact, an appropriate time. And my second example, which is of a slightly different format, is the relationship between tax and trusts. 
As is well known to many in this room, the use of domestic tax by New Zealanders has been seen for a number of years as a cause of concern. That concern has been apparent in the courts, especially in relation to property cases and in an academic writing. 2002, the Law Commission published a report, sort of obviously titled Some Problems in the Law of Trust. In 2009, it embarked on a major project on the Law of Trusts, beginning with an issues paper and ending with a draft trust act in 2013. At the heart of these concerns was the observation that settlers were essentially ignoring trust law and continuing to treat trust property as if it were still their own. The Law Commission stated that in some cases, settlers were acting, and I quote, as a principal would in an agency. Now the Law Commission identified quite clearly that income tax and previously estate duties were a significant reason why so many New Zealanders were so fond of, of trusts. Having made that correct connection, the next step might have been to ponder the consequences of the fact that the main context in which people interact with trusts is a tax context. Related to that, obviously, the professional advisor that they're most likely to engage with in the formulation and management of their trusts would, one think, be their tax advisor. Might then many people think of trust law and tax rules about trusts as being synonymous? If we are troubled that New Zealanders appear to ignore trust law, that settlers treat trust property as their own, that many treat a trust relationship as if it were an agency relationship, might it perhaps be a useful idea to analyse the rules they encounter on a regular and ongoing basis? The rules they encounter in practice, and their advisers work with on a daily basis, might perhaps provide a clue to enriching our understanding of how people act. Although the Law Commission report used tax law when considering how to formulate some particular look-through provisions and the like, to deal with the misuse of trusts, there appears to be little or no engagement with the substantive tax rules about trusts. Now, the New Zealand treatment of trusts for income tax purposes is very unusual internationally. It's described as a settler-based regime because the taxation of the trust turns on the residence of the settler. It has been said that New Zealand rules operate on the principle that the trustee is an agent for the settler as a matter of economics rather than law. That is to say, the trustees, and I quote, carry out the functions with respect to trust property that the settler could do for themselves had they not transferred the assets. Now you'll also be relieved to know that this is not the moment for an extensive consideration of the intricacies of the taxation of trusts. However, the general point I want to make is that for good tax policy reasons, the tax rules about trusts are predicated on economics rather than trust law. In other ways, the tax rules appear inconsistent with the sort of underlying truth of trust law that the settle, settler settles the property on trustees and goes off to the modern equivalent of the Crusades. For example, the Income Tax Act 2007 makes it explicit that the settler is liable, and I quote from the Act, is an agent of the trustee for income tax payable by the trustee. Further, in relation to certain provisions in uh, by making gains from land transactions subject to income tax, settlers are associated persons of the trustees of a trust they settle, and then the beneficiaries of a trust they settle. To put it in unacceptably simple language, Settlers have an ongoing resonance in tax trust rules. The concept of agency is overtly embraced in the tax rules on trusts. Now, I ought not to be taken as thinking that such an analysis would have been certain to give the Law Commission the answer to the question it set out to consider. But I do think that ignoring tax trust rules left a fertile avenue of analysis unexplored. Now, to my mind, these two examples that I've given tonight suggest that treating tax as law, but not as we know it, leaving it disconnected from the rest of law, is best unfortunate. It's unfortunate for tax law, and I think in some instances it's unfortunate for other areas of the law as well. It's been my ambition as a teacher and as a researcher to open those connections between tax and the rest of law. And it's to that pursuit 
I will now return. And that is tax, commerce, history, and law. Perhaps this has been the map of my academic journey after all. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tony Ballantyne, and as PVC Humanities, it is my great pleasure uh, to deliver a vote of thanks to Shelley. Um, she's offered an excellent lecture, I think, um, providing rich insights into the development of her field of work and taking us on a journey. Now, she said at the outset that journey was not the story of her own research development, but rather the journey of tax as a law subject, a subject of both research and teaching. Um, she has taken us on that journey, exploring what she called the apparent oddity of tax's status and the way in which it has been often imagined not really as a part of law. She has noted that tax has really been seen as a domain of the chartered accountants. It is a territory that lawyers have been hesitant to explore and to think about. This is something that she has pressed against in the lecture, arguing for the need to rethink the isolation of tax law underlining both the benefits that might come to the taxation system if there were stronger links between tax and legal scholarship and the strengths that might come to the legal system um, through a reconnection, but the kind of reconnection that Shelley has advocated. And these are really important questions. Early on in her lecture, Shelley offered us a quote from Sir Ivor Richardson, which stressed the importance of taxation because it sits at the intersection of accounting economic life, administration, and the operation of law. In a similar vein, Shelley's lecture has reminded us that thinking about tax requires us to draw upon insights from a range of disciplines in addition to law, history, philosophy, political science, and accounting, she itemised. So despite her protestations to the contrary, there has been very clear elements of a journey uh, in this lecture. The story of her own return, to her LLB and her entry into working here in the faculty, observations of an early warning from a music teacher, the importance of the work of Philip Baker, and the generative nature of a comment or exchange with Sir Ivor Richardson. I think uh, it has really illuminated the history of our university to speak about the, the history of teaching law uh, and tax and law, sorry, at Otago, and the place of tax within legal education more broadly. And that, of course, has been a key context for her own work. And as she acknowledged at the end of a lecture, implicit within Shelley's talk, were the analytical perspectives that she has drawn upon from history, accounting, and law itself. A, a scholarly toolkit that she has assembled across the arc of her own professional and academic life. So I think Shelley has done a terrific job in making a compelling case for the pedagogical, intellectual, and legal significance of thinking about tax as law. I think she has been so successful that she will have con convinced almost all of you to her agree with her belief that tax is, quote, endlessly fascinating. <laughs> so, th <laughs> there we go, a clear assertion. Um, thank you all for coming, and um, thank you all for being part of the celebration of um, Shelley's promotion, becoming Professor Griffiths, which is tremendous. Please join the academic party uh, for some refreshments across in seminar room five on the other side of the corridor. But could we end please by joining me in congratulating Professor Griffiths. <laughs>